In ancient history, most cultures refer to a mysterious lineage of giants that lived just before a great flood that changed the face of the earth. This is attested by numerous legends, many of which relate these enigmatic beings to a golden age of knowledge, if not directly to the creation of human beings. Unlike orthodox archaeology, which rejects these stories as mythical and improbable, there are many researchers who defend the existence of these disturbing creatures. In 1896 Dr. Frederick Cook, the controversial explorer and physician, made some interesting claims of having found giants among the Ona of Patagonia during his expedition. His photographs and notes could offer some explanation to the endless stories of giants in that part of the world, that there really were tribes that had an average of 7 feet in height for men, with some people being 8 feet. Old photos in a newspaper of 1899 showed the height of some of the members of the Patagonian tribe Ona. The photo of what appeared to be two Ona Indians almost seven feet tall, together with one of the companions of the Belgian expedition. In an interview of February 1938 in the magazine Popular Photography, Dr. Frederick Cook stated that the Ona tribe that he met in 1897 were about seven feet tall, they wore animal skins, resistance from horse and the strength of the bull and lived in simple homes made of tree branches. The people Dr. Cook photographed in 1897 were the Onas, or Selknam Nation, an almost extinct people who were mercilessly expelled from their lands and slaughtered by the new settlers that come in the 19th century. The tall, and impressively built Selknam, wore long animal skins, lived in log huts, and carried bows and arrows, these were the last survivors and were among the most tribal primitives in all the Americas. We have some legends among the native peoples of North America with respect to the red-headed cannibal giants, as well as some historical accounts of the high and powerful Karankawa, also suspected cannibals. It may be that these ferocious and powerful types may have left a lasting impression on the neighboring tribes, and later on the European settlers, who became the nightmare men. The first time that was heard about the civilization of the giants of Patagonia, we have to go to the records of the famous explorer Fernando de Magallanes. Magahayanes never wrote the account of his trip, since he died in a battle in the Philippines long before his ship returned to Europe. Of a crew of 260 people who traveled with Magahayanes in 1519, only 18 men returned and, among them, Antonio Pigafetta. Pigafetta was in charge of writing these records, and tells us the following about the first contact with the Patagones. We spent two months in that place without seeing anyone. One day, suddenly we saw a naked man of giant stature on the shore of the harbor. The captain general sent one of our men to the giant, the man took the giant to an islet on which the captain general was waiting. When the giant was in the general captaincy in our presence, he marveled and signaled with a finger lifting it up, making us believe that we had arrived from heaven. He was so tall that we only left him to the waist, he was well proportioned. His face was large and painted red everywhere while around his eyes, they were painted yellow. His thin hair was painted white. He was dressed in skins stitched with animals. His feet were covered with skins, thus simulating shoes. In his hand he carried a short but heavy bow, with a rope a little thicker than those of the lute, made from the intestines of the same animal, and a bunch of cane arrows instead of short feathers like ours, and with white dots and black flint stones like Turkish dates, instead of iron. Those points had to be made with another miss. 100 years later, at the Ecompassed World London, the first detailed account of circumnavigation by Sir Francis Drake, the author, Drake's nephew, wrote. Magahians was not totally wrong when naming the giants, as they usually differ from the common species of men, both in stature, goods, and the strength of the body, as well as in the severity of their voice. Apparently those peoples were very wild and intimidating for the first year Europeans. Could the fables of giants, or even wild hairy men, in part, rely on such encounters with these strange, but terribly tribes, misunderstood and now exterminated? This is where we see that the epithet giant may not have been used in vain by the Iberians who explored Patagonia. Could it be the Patagonians' distant relatives of those seven to eight feet giants, protagonists of extravagant indigenous legends, and whose skeletons were found at the other end of America? And, if so, could that great height be a genetic inheritance of an antediluvian race of giants like the Nephilim mentioned in the Bible?